Good morning, everybody here in the room. It's good to see you this morning. Good morning, everybody online. Thanks for joining us. Hope you're having a great day. Hope you're warm. You're probably warmer than the rest of us. It's a little chilly outside. That's okay. This morning, I want to start things off with a story. Uh, I went to college with these two sisters, both just really lovely, like wonderful, sweet, beautiful girls. Not surprisingly, a lot of guys wanted to date them, and their dad knew it. And that's why he had a lot of rules for guys that wanted to date his daughters. A lot of hoops you had to jump through. One of those didn't seem so bad at first. You had to have a a sit-down meeting with him face-to-face. And like I said, not too frightening, except that he lived three hours away in St. Louis from where we went to school. So that meeting was a little bit more of an undertaking. And at that meeting, prospective boyfriends had to have a certain clean-cut look about him. You know, he, he was a little reasonable, you know, just nothing too crazy in the hair or piercing or tattoo department. Facial hair, eh, it was kind of a roll of the dice, just depending on how well kept it was. The second hoop the boyfriends or potential boyfriends had to jump through is they had to have a solid game plan for life. Now, this, this was college. You know, this is where you discover things and you change your mind a lot as you just get these new experiences, and, and you're supposed to change your plans a lot. That's what you do in college, but that, that wasn't good enough for Dad. You needed at least a solid five-year outlook of what your life was going to look like after school. So a lot of guys just failed there. And then there was the most difficult hoop of all to jump through. He had to like you. And like that never happened. He just didn't like any of these guys that wanted to date his little girls. And many guys I knew tried to date these girls. They failed the test. They got fed up. They moved on. But then there came my best friend. I have known this guy uh, basically my whole life. You know, he's three weeks younger than me. We, we went to the same church, went to the same school. And he really, really wanted to date the oldest sister. But he had a lot of problems, a lot of strikes against him. He had long hair and a scruffy chin. That was a no-no. He had what could barely be called an idea of what he wanted to do after school, their strike two. And dad just flat out didn't like him. He just didn't. There's nothing he could do to change that. He struck out really before he ever got started, which is unfortunate. But he wouldn't give up. He just kept pursuing this girl. He kept calling the dad saying, can we please have another meeting? Can we please try again? And so on. And there are a lot of people that tried to talk him out of it. Some people said, better men than you have tried and failed, buddy. Just move on. But some of them had a different perspective. They said, you know what? She likes you. You like her. Just date the girl anyway. Forget the dad and what he wants. You just do you. But my friend had long-term intentions with this girl. And he knew that a rocky start at the beginning of the relationship was only going to complicate things further down the road. And so he played the game, and he jumped through the hoops, and he cleared the hurdles. And it took him two years, but he eventually wore the dad down. He started dating the girl. Today, they're married, and actually, the whole family gets along really, really well. Now, when I hear that story about my buddy, I I think about all the stuff he had to go through, and I actually see a lot of parallels between his experience and our experience of trying to get the good things in our lives that we want. We all want good stuff. I mean, we all want genuinely good things. Sometimes we want bad things, but most of the time, what we want are genuinely good things. But a lot of times, in order to get that good stuff, there are some hoops we have to jump through or some hurdles we have to clear. The road isn't always as direct as we wish it was. Sometimes, you know, we got to do some twists and turns through the proper channels. And along that journey, there's always this little voice in our head saying, you know what, you want that thing. Just go get it. Just take a shortcut, cut some corners, fudge a little bit. Just go get that good thing that you want in your life. But we all also wrestle with this question, or that really this prospect of having a short-term good versus the long-term good that we all actually want. Like, we all want the fullest experience of good possible. And that brings us to our message this morning. Today's message is part four in a series called Filled. And we've been looking at God as our provider. How does he fill our lives? What does that provision look like? And we've talked about a lot of things in this series over the last three weeks. We've talked about the way that God tends to fill our life. We've talked about the generosity that he shows us. We've talked about how sometimes he provides us opportunities and we have to be bold enough to seize those. Whether you've been with us all three weeks or you're just tuning in, you're just hearing this, something should be pretty clear to you right now. We serve a very generous God who really, truly wants something good for our lives. I think the the million dollar question that we all ask is, how do I get it? How do I experience God's fullest good 
for my life? That's the question that we're wrestling with this morning. Is it one of those things where I have to follow all the twists and turns and jump through the hoops, or is there a shortcut that I can take to just go grab it? To answer that question, we're going to be looking once again at the book of Ruth. So if you have your Bibles with you, I would encourage you to turn to the Old Testament, to the book of Ruth. We're going to be looking at chapter 4. If you don't have your Bible with you, as always, you can follow along on the screens to the side or download the FCC Mammoth app to your mobile device. You can click the Sunday button in the bottom right-hand corner, and you'll find a lot of different tools that you can use. The one that's going to be most useful right now, especially if you're at home, is going to be the Sermon Notes button. It's got our notes, it's got our passage pulled up, ready for us to engage and interact with together today. So, how do I experience God's fullest good for my life? That's what we all want. And opening our lives up to that possibility requires us to open up our minds to an incredibly important and yet sometimes hard to swallow truth. Here it is. The good that I want may not be the good that matters most. The good that I really, really want, that is genuinely good, it may just not be the good that matters most right now. And there's an illustration of this in the story of Ruth. We're going to be looking at a guy named Boaz. If you weren't with us so far, last week we heard how Ruth came to Boaz and said, I really want you to marry me. And Boaz said, well, I would really much like to marry you. But there was this problem, there's this cultural practice that we're going to talk about this morning called the guardian redeemer, and we'll define what that is a little more clearly, that stands in the way. There's some hoops that Boaz is going to have to jump through in order to attain this good thing. So let's read about how he goes about that. This is Ruth chapter 4, verse 1. It says, meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, sit down. So he went over and he sat down. Boaz took 10 of the elders to the town of the town and said, sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, meaning to purchase it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. And the guardian redeemer said, I will redeem it. So like we said, Ruth wants to marry Boaz, Boaz wants to marry Ruth, but standing in the way is this cultural practice, the guardian redeemer. Just a brief recap of what that is. In ancient Israelite culture, if a man were to pass away, there would be the responsibility of the closest living relative to redeem his family property if it was like in the hands of a third party so that that family land stayed in the family, the clan, the extended family. And it was also the guardian redeemer's responsibility to marry the widow of the deceased, this is the weird part, and to produce an heir, meaning a child, so that the name of the deceased person would carry on and continue and they wouldn't be forgotten. That was one of the great fears of ancient Israelite people. In fact, if you really, really wanted to talk some ancient Israelite smack talk, you would throw this curse on them. May your name disappear and your memory be forgotten. That was the greatest insult that you could really give to somebody. And really, I think we still resonate with that. Nobody wants to be forgotten. So this heir was a way for their name to continue on. It was a really important cultural practice. And Boaz is a guardian redeemer. He's in the family. He's just not the guardian redeemer. There's another guy who's closer in line. So Boaz goes to resolve the matter. He goes to the city gate, which was where all legal proceedings happened. And wouldn't you know it, the one guy he needs to talk to just happens to be walking through about that time. And this is the point in the story where we should all recognize by now, this is not a coincidence. This is God reaching in his hand to work his providential will. His will worked in his time in the life of Boaz and this guy. So this guy comes along. Boaz says, have a seat. I'll go get the town elders. And he sits them down. And then the legal proceedings start. And Boaz lays out his case. Our relative, Naomi, who we met in chapter 1. Her husband passed away. Her son's passed away. She's a widow. He says she is ready to give up the rights to the family land so that our family can redeem it. And you are next in line. So you get to say yay or nay. If you don't, just let me know because I'm very interested. Now, you may have noticed in there, Boaz doesn't say anything about Ruth. What's the deal there? He's just talking about this family land. 
And here's the deal. What, what we have is this, this issue of the land and the issue of Ruth are two separate issues, but they are almost inseparably intertwined with one another. As the land goes, so goes Ruth. So Boaz is really hoping that this guardian redeemer says, you know what, I'm just not interested. But much to his dismay, the guy says, oh, I'm very interested. And Boaz's heart must have sunk there. Because if he doesn't have right to purchase the land, he's never going to get a chance to marry Ruth. Here's the issue. Boaz jumped through all the hoops. He cleared the hurdles. He went down that winding trail, he played by the rules, he played the game, and it put everything that he wanted in jeopardy. But was that the worst thing that could happen? We have to take a step back here and look at all the really big things that are at stake. This issue of the land, this insurance that future generations will have something to farm, that they won't suffer from poverty and starvation, that's a really big deal to make sure it stays in the family. Producing an heir, making sure that Elimelech's name is not forgotten from history is a really big deal. We've got these two women, Naomi and Ruth, that presently are widows that are living in poverty and are only getting by because they're kind of scrounging around fields and picking up grain. They need to be taken care of. They need to be provided for. That's a really big deal. And all of that stuff is still going to be taken care of even if Boaz doesn't marry Ruth. If this guardian redeemer guy buys the land and marries Ruth, all of that stuff will still be okay. Even in the big picture of things, Boaz couldn't have known this, but we get that inside look. God's plans to work through this specific family in the near future to bless the entire world is still going to be on track, even if Boaz doesn't marry Ruth. This guardian redeemer, he's still part of the right family in the right clan, in the right nation. So all the really big high-stakes stuff is going to be okay. And Boaz seems to recognize this. And that's why he trusts the system. That's why he jumps through the hoops. That's why he's willing to put what he wants, this good stuff, admittedly, at risk. Because he understands that as good as it is, It is not a good enough reason to jeopardize his character or his integrity by undercutting what is expected. And even more important, as good as marrying Ruth would be, it is not a good enough reason to betray his God and to shame him by cutting corners and taking shortcuts, circumventing the law. That's why Boaz is willing to put it all on the line. He understands that there are greater goods that he has to protect and live in light of. And that's a really important lesson for you and I today. Because there are so many genuinely good things that we want. For example, right now, I want a big fatty bacon slathered cheeseburger. That sounds delicious. I will think that that's a good thing. It's also even better when paired with chili cheese fries, a strawberry milkshake, and some Tums, because that's the age that I am. (laughs) It's good. It is undeniably good. Here's the thing. There is a more important good that I have to live in light of called heart health, because it turns out those bacon slathered cheeseburgers do a number on your life expectancy. Now, I could just indulge in that, and it would be a good thing. There'd probably be some consequences down the road, though. Health is important. I have a family to think about. I just genuinely enjoy my life. I'd like to prolong my years as long as reasonably possible. That is a more important good I have to protect and live in light of, even if it costs me something as good as a cheeseburger now and then. You want some good stuff in your life, some unquestionably good things. Right now, you probably want one of those cheeseburgers. But you probably want some more significant things, too. You probably want to achieve something or you want to accomplish something, or you want to establish yourself in some way, or you want to acquire something, or you want to draw closer to someone in some kind of relationship. All undeniably good things. And I hope that each and every one of them fills your life to the fullest extent. But as good as those things are, there are some more important goods that we have to live in light of. As Boaz illustrates, Our faithfulness to our God really matters. And our worship of our Creator really matters. 
and our integrity before God and his commands really actually matter. And in fact, this stuff matters so much that they are worth living in light of and protecting, even if it costs us some of the good stuff that we want in the short term and immediate life that we have. That is a hard pill to swallow sometimes. But it's such an important lesson. I, I was flipping through my Facebook feed a couple of days ago, and there was a, an ad for a new Bible study curriculum that came across. And it was called Christian Sexuality. And it featured a well-known Bible teacher, Francis Chan. Um, he, he asked a really provocative question. He said, how much do you desire God? How much do you really desire to know him and draw close to him and follow him? Do you desire him so much that you're willing to stop having sex with your boyfriend or girlfriend? Do you really hunger for God so much you're willing to say no to your sexual appetites? And I thought, that is a really good way to approach that topic. In fact, it's so good, it can't be limited just to that context. We all need to ask ourselves that question, how much do I desire God? How much do I really yearn to know him and draw near to him. Is it enough to fill in the blank? Do I desire to know this God so much that I'm willing to let that dream die? Am I willing to miss out on this experience? Am I willing to do without this acquisition or this achievement? How much do I really yearn for him? That's a, a question to wrestle with in our lives. I hope the answer for all of us is yes. Yes, I, I do desire him that much because that's actually the key to experiencing the full good that God has in store for us. Jesus, in, in John chapter 10, he's talking to a group of people and he says a lot of great things in that chapter. But the one that really draws my attention almost every time is what he says towards the end of the conversation. He says, I've come that they may have life and experience it or have it to the fullest, that they may have life to the full. Different versions translated different ways. In the Greek, it basically says, I've come that they may have super abundant life. And it's really kind of an obnoxious phrase when you think about it. It's kind of like when the little kids say really a lot. Jesus is essentially saying, I've come that they may have really, 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 <gasps> Really, 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 really full life. And that's what he comes to bring. That full life, the full experience of the good that God intends for us. It's not found in pursuing sinful things. It's not even found in pursuing good things immediately. It's found in pursuing him. Protecting that first and foremost good in our lives. Sometimes the good that we want may not be the most important good. It doesn't mean it's bad. There are just more important things we have to live in light of. And like I said, that's a difficult pill to swallow. Because sometimes it means saying no even to good things in our lives. Maybe it's not the right time. Maybe it's just not the right season. We, we don't know. But whenever we come to that moment, inevitably, there's that little voice that shows up in our ear. You want it. It's good. Just go get it. Even if you have to cut some corners, even if you have to take some shortcuts, even if you have to sell your integrity just a little bit, just go get it. It's good. It's yours. You want it? Go get it. We've all been there. In fact, I was talking with somebody after first service today, and they said, you know, we ran into this experience where, you know, my, my sister and I, we, our, our mom or our aunt was in a nursing home, and we were taking care of her, and, and they let the, the, they were taking care of the billing. They let her insurance lapse. And we had a family member that was working for that insurance company. He said, just write a check, just post, you know, post date it or predate it, whichever the case was. We'll make it work. And they said, no, no, we're not going to do that. You know, it was a strong temptation because it would fix a lot of problems and it seems like it would accomplish something good. But in the end, it actually ended up helping them that they walked that straight and narrow road. We all face those temptations, those little things that says, just take the shortcut. But here's the deal. Shortcuts almost always shortchange our experience of good. The shortcut will almost always sell short or fall short of what could have been. Boaz is a great example of this. He could have actually married Ruth and gotten what he wanted. He said, Ruth, I love you. You love me. Let's throw the culture to the wind. Forget the law. We're just going to go do what our hearts feel is right and marry each other. He actually could have done that. But there would have been a lot of consequences to that shortcut. 
The land still would not have been redeemed, meaning future generations may have lived in poverty and it would have been Boaz's fault. Ruth may not have produced a legitimate heir for Elimelech, meaning that his name would have been forgotten and a great shame would have fallen upon his family and that would have been Boaz's fault. His character in the best circumstances, character and integrity would be completely shot. People wouldn't want to do business with him. Probably the more likely scenario, he would be arrested and there would be legal ramifications for his actions. He would have gotten that short-term good in his life. He would have gotten that good thing, but he would not have been able to have enjoyed it to its fullest extent or possibility. He would have always been reminded of the shame or the embarrassment or the wrongdoing or the guilt. The legal ramifications alone would follow him through life. The shortcut would have shortchanged him. And that's true of this guardian redeemer. Even he understands that truth. We don't know what kind of a guy he really is. We don't know much about him. We don't even know his name. But he seems to be a, yeah, an okay guy. Not bad, but maybe not somebody we want to aspire to be. Look at his response to the situation. First, he says, yeah, I'm definitely interested in this land. And then in verse five, he goes, on the day that you buy the land, Boaz said, the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. And at this, the guardian redeemer said, oh, then I can't redeem it uh, because it might endanger my own estate. So you redeem it yourself. Um, I can't do it. I pass. So at first, you know, he's really excited because he sees the prospect of acquiring this land, and with land comes profit. He sees dollar signs, or I don't know, whatever their currency was, denarii signs in his eyes, and he's ready to make some money. But then when he learns that he's also going to have to take care of Naomi and take care of Ruth and father a child, and that child will become the inheritor of this property, he says, you know what, this is just going to get way too expensive. It's going to be some weird legal things that my children have to deal with, and it's going to be this nasty thing when the will is settled. We've all been there and heard that. He's like, I don't want to deal with it. I'm out. You deal with it. So, you know, not a bad guy, maybe a little self-interested, but even he understands that the shortcut was going to shortchange him. He had options. He could have said, oh yeah, I'll definitely buy that land and bought it and then just simply reneged on the marriage to Ruth. He could have done that. Now, it would have completely shot his reputation and credibility in the community, which means he's probably going to lose some business partners, but he could have gotten that short-term gain. He could have also purchased the property and then said, you know what, Boaz, I'm not interested. You marry Ruth. And again, he could have done that. Same outcome. He's a guy that can't follow through on his word or live up to his obligations. He's going to have some short-term gain, but he's going to have long-term consequence. He's never going to be able to fully enjoy the land that he has worked so hard to purchase. And so he says, you know what, it's, I'm not going to do it. The shortcut is only going to short change. And you and I, we get this. We still live in light of this most of the time. I mean, just take a look at this picture. Here's an example. It's kind of hard to see, but this is a picture of an electrical outlet that's been, in, in, I'll say, installed, quote, quote, into the wall uh, with silicone caulking. Um, there, there's no box back there. It's just live wires. He put a hole in a wall, put live wires through, hooked it up, and then just caulked the whole thing in. Now, that is a short-term solution to the problem. He does have electricity at that outlet. He can plug in a lamp or he can plug in a TV. It will work, but I, I have a feeling that joy is going to be diminished every time he tries to plug or unplug something in, wondering, am I going to get electrocuted? Or at the very least, every night when he lays down, and I say he because you know it was a guy that did this. At the very least, when he lays down at night and wonders, is tonight the night my house is going to burn down? There's not a lot of peace to be had when you shortchange yourself. Because short changing, or shortcuts always lead to a short change in the good that we experience. And we get this. We would all agree, illegality, even if it gains something good, is going to come at a cost. Immorality, even if I gain something good, it's going to come at a cost. Manipulating people in relationships, even if I get what I want, is going to incur a cost. We all agree to this, except when it's the stuff that we want. And then the temptation becomes a little stronger. And we hear that voice and we think, well, you know, maybe, maybe this time would be okay. Maybe I'll be the exception. Maybe I'll get away with it. Maybe I'll squeak through the cracks and God won't notice. It's not going to happen. Shortcuts inevitably always shortchange our experience of good. Even if we gain something, it will likely be a diminished experience of good. 
It may be accompanied by shame. It may be accompanied by embarrassment. It may be accompanied by dirty looks from your neighbors. It may be accompanied by that, uh, that knowledge that I have shortchanged my God in some way. That good is diminished anytime we take that shortcut. There was a really, really wise guy that once said, what good is it to gain the whole world and yet forfeit your soul? And I think he knew what he was talking about there. Shortcuts inevitably shortchange our experience of what could have been fulfilling and good. Rather, we need to take a step back and, and really take something from the example of Boaz. Our full good is not found by shortchanging God. Rather, God's full, or our, our fullest experience of the good that God has in store for us comes through our fullest commitment to Him. God's fullest good for us is found through our fullest commitment to him. Again, we look at Boaz for a minute. Boaz walked this windy road. He jumped through the hoops. He cleared the hurdles. He trusted the system. Even though it put what he wanted in jeopardy, he maintained his consistency and his integrity before the Lord. And now he's able to marry Ruth. But he doesn't just get to marry her. He gets to marry her without any guilt, without any shame, without any um, hindrance, without any, any condemnation, without any guilt of knowing I've betrayed the law or my integrity or God. He gets to marry her and enjoy that good to its fullest possible extent. And that's what I mean when I say we get to experience God's fullest good for our lives. I'm not saying that you're going to, you know, if, if you walk the straight and narrow path, you're going to buy the next winning Mega Millions ticket. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is the good that God has provided for your life, the opportunities that he has set before you, when we walk in accordance with him and protect these greater goods, we are able to enjoy that provision to its fullest extent without any of the hindrances that make us feel a little empty inside. Boaz follows the rules, he marries Ruth, and he does so not just with, so he doesn't just get that good, he does so with the blessing of his entire community as well. Look at how the story ends. This is down in verse 11. It says, Then the elders and all the people at the gate, they said, We are witnesses of this union. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. So the two ladies who are the highest revered women in all of our history, we pray that that woman, uh, that your wife be just like them, that she be blessed. And then he says, may you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem, which are cities in that region. May your name be revered throughout all the countryside and may everybody know who you are because of the goodness flowing from your life. And then they go on to say, through the offspring that the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez whom Tamar bore to Judah. So the founders of our people, our George Washingtons, Lincolns, you know, the people on Mount Rushmore, may this woman and the child that she bears for you make you like one of them, that you would be revered throughout all the land. This is a monumental blessing. And it's the entire community's way of saying, we approve of this marriage and we wish you the best. Boaz doesn't have to look over his shoulder. He doesn't have to wonder what if. He doesn't have to live with guilt or shame. He is absolutely 100% free to revel in all the good that this union possibly poses. This is a good thing. And he experiences that fullest good because his commitment to God was at its fullest. You and I, the same thing is true. When our commitment to these greater goods is at their fullest extent, we start to experience the fullness of what God has filled our lives with. It kind of reminds me of a story about some railroad workers way, way back in the day. One of them was laying track with this new rail expansion with his coworkers, and, and they saw this car coming in the distance. And so it, you know, it stopped. Obviously, it wasn't going to come speeding through. There's no track. But they stopped, you know, and somebody got out, and a couple of guys walked up, and they recognized it was the president of the railroad. And the president looked over at this new expansion. He came to check it out himself, and he saw the guy laying rail. He said, Jim, Jim, come on over here. Let's have lunch together. And so the rail worker and the president of the railroad, they went into the car. They were there about an hour, came out, shook hands, parted ways. And meanwhile, the coworkers are just dumbfounded. And they come back and say, Jim, how do you know the president of the company? And Jim said, well, actually, we started together laying rail way back in the day. And then they asked the question, well, how did he become the president of the company and you're still stuck here laying rail? And Jim said, well, because I went to work for a dollar a day, but he went to work for the railroad. 
What Jim meant by that was they both wanted a paycheck. Who wouldn't want their paycheck? But, but Jim's commitment was really just to that immediate good. Once he got that dollar a day, he was happy. He wasn't really going to pursue anything beyond that. But this other guy, he was committed to something bigger. He was committed to this company, to its ways, to the opportunities. He gave himself over to this company, and as a result, he experienced all the fullness that that company had to offer. And in a lot of ways, that mirrors our relationship with God. We all want good things in life, undeniably, and I hope every single one of us find those good things, but sometimes we become so focused on finding the short-term good that that's what we end up living for, even if we have to take some shortcuts. But if we are willing to commit ourselves to someone greater, he opens up the possibility of all the fullness and all the good that he intends for us to enjoy. And I would remind us that it's not found in pursuing sinful things. It's not found even in pursuing good things in the short term. Life and life to the full is found in pursuing Christ. It's found in Him. He is the key not just to joy today, but joy forever. Not just provision today, but provision forever. Not just full life for these 80 or so years that we tread this earth, but for eternity. God's full good that he really yearns for us to experience that good thing. It's found in committing and following Christ. And to that end, I would encourage each of you, if you've not made that decision or even explored that option before, I'd encourage you to take a connection card, that little postcard-looking thing on the back of the seat in front of you. Just put your name and your phone number down and just simply say, I want to learn more about Jesus. Maybe you're just starting this journey. Maybe you're ready to make a decision. I don't know, but we're going to get in contact and we're going to figure this out so that you can start to understand who Jesus is, what he has done, and how this fullness of life is found in him. Let me end our time together this morning with some encouragement. Because some of us are walking this road. And some of us are jumping through the hoops. And we are walking the straight and narrow. And we're starting to wonder, is it worth it? Because it's not always easy. And we see other people who are taking shortcuts. We see the state of our country and how it's just kind of maybe up in the air right now. And everything's a lot, it's really uncertain. We're starting to wonder, is it even worth walking this road and walking with God anymore? And I want to encourage you, absolutely it is. I'm not saying that the road is easy. Sometimes it's long and it's arduous, but it is absolutely worth it because we're after more than just short-term good. There's this long-term good that we all yearn and desire, and it is found in Christ and committing to him. So trust the example of Boaz, the guy who committed to to jumping through the hoops and walking through the road and, you know, all that. Trust his example because he shows us that faithfulness is worth it. Trust the the words of Christ, that fullness is found in him and in no one else. And start to taste that goodness that God has in store for you. On that note, maybe you are following Christ. Maybe you've been following him for a while and, and you're like, I don't know if I really taste the fullness in my life. When I say that you need to pursue Christ and commit to him, I mean actually pursue and commit to him. Anybody can say, I believe in Jesus But somebody who is actually committed and walking with him, that's a different story. That means getting to know him. That means saying no, even to good things, so that I can desire and follow him even closer. It means getting to know him through prayer, getting to know him through the word. Maybe you don't know where to start. I would encourage you to join our weekly Bible reading program. It's posted every Monday on Facebook, on our app, and our email. When we get our website updated, it'll be on the website. Any electronic communication that we have, it will be posted there. It's a great opportunity to start reading Scripture and getting to know who Jesus is. What is he like? What does he ask of me? What does a disciple look like? How can I actually follow him and pursue him? Because that's where fullness is found. Whatever your course of action may be, whether you need to get to know Christ or we just need to follow closer, I would encourage you to take that step to commit to God, to follow him fully because the fullest good that he desires for our lives is experienced in fully committing to him. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for today and we thank you for how you have filled us. You have filled our lives with opportunity. You filled us with provision. You filled us with people who love and who care about us. We have so many blessings right here in this life, but we know that because of Christ, your goodness doesn't end. It extends on and on and on and on that we get to taste your goodness and we get to be filled by you and your generosity for all eternity. 
We praise you for the work that you've done in Christ. And it's my prayer for all those in here today, whether we are followers of Jesus or we're just Jesus curious, that you would fill us with that hunger and that desire to know you more, to commit to you, to say no even to good things so that we can say yes to the greatest good of living for you. May you fill our lives and may we taste all the good that you intend for it. In Jesus' name, amen.